First of all, thanks everybody for attending uh, what is certainly a first for us in presenting our results remotely um, with the use of technology. I'm sure you guys are getting pretty familiar with this now. Um, what we will do is, is take questions towards the end, if that's okay with everybody. It won't quite be the level of interaction we normally like to, to have in our presentations. Um, of course, we'd rather be presenting to you all face to face and we very much hope to see you all in person for our H1 results in September. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video, but let's dig into the detail of the presentation. So moving to slide three, it's been another very busy month for Sumo Group. We've made some great progress. I won't talk through everything in detail on this slide. I think we talked to, to most things as we go through the presentation, but some key highlights are, first of all, obviously the group's um, performance being slightly ahead of market expectations. And as usual, I'll let David talk you through the detail of the numbers shortly. I should also point to you the, the new disclosure detail around our own IP generation uh, with the performance of roughly a third of revenues coming from ideas and concepts originated from within the group. Uh, and again, David will go into more details on that. We've added three new studios uh, in, in 2019. 2019 does seem like a, a very distant memory now. Um, it, it's hard to think it was only a few months ago we wrapped up the year. But finishing the year, having acquired Red Kite Games, which we relocated to Leeds, opened the new studio in Leamington, and, and towards the back end of the year, the new studio in Warrington gave us three additional locations. And also the very strong headcount growth during 2019, where we finished with a headcount of 766, uh, which was uh, a tremendous achievement um, off the back of the, the previous year as well. I'm going to have to mention it, and, and that is COVID-19. Um, the reason we're all sat hundreds of miles apart um, it's uh, something which is obviously causing a great deal of, of uncertainty around uh, everybody's daily and working life. We don't have a crystal ball, um, so the outlook for the year is, is presently unclear, but there are a few things that, that I want to go through on. Um, and first of all, just to talk about uh, the fact that we've successfully migrated all of our production teams and support teams to working from home. Uh, we started preparing for that quite early and we migrated all the teams in advance of the lockdown. We've had unprecedented support from our partners and we'd like to thank them for facilitating our needs. Confidentiality is always a challenge in, in what we do and having the support of our partners to be able to, to relocate to working from home has been nothing short of uh, you know, a great example of the type of depth of relationships we have. And then finally, not so it's all negative, but every cloud has a silver lining and COVID may provide an opportunity for more remote work and a better flexible workforce going forward. But I'll move on to slide four, which just gives us a little bit more detail around the impact of COVID-19. First of all, in terms of status, we don't have anybody furloughed within our business. Everybody is working from home and contributing to, to the ongoing success of the business. In terms of demand, we're not seeing any slowdown in business development. And in fact, our team's been busier than ever, partly driven by the fact that the GDC, the major event was canceled, but the guys set up their own virtual GDC and conducted all their meetings um, remotely, a fantastic achievement. And they're making great progress. In terms of supply, Probably our biggest challenge and, and the biggest impact we expect to see is going to be around recruitment for the year. We do expect significant challenges. We're seeing recruitment agencies within the video game business furlough their own staff because of the slowdown in, in people looking to move jobs. It's obviously not top of people's minds right now. Uh, however, we do have our own internal dedicated recruitment team. David will talk a little bit more about uh, our forecasts around headcount growth, but we are expecting obviously a lower attrition as well. And then in terms of detailed impact, 
we've been monitoring the velocity of where we're tracking since moving to work from home. So we've got confidence around where we believe we're going to go this year. So moving on to slide five, what we can see here is the, the productivity of projects pre working from home, the disruption period and then post uh, working from home and the pickup after settle, settling into working from home with each project. If I take project A as an example, it's in fairly early phases of development. It's a fairly large team, but with a high degree of production stability. We can see where there was a slight dip as we moved to working from home, but now productivity has recovered back to where it was whilst we we're all office based. Project B, similar, you can see the productivity prior, a slightly bigger dip as we move to working from home. This project's in an early phase of pre-production um, and had slightly more disruption on moving people to work from home. But in fact, productivity has increased, possibly due to the lack of distraction of being based in the office. And then we've got project C, which is a large scale project. Moving from home is still within the dip. It started to recover. It's taken us slightly longer. It's in the final phases of development. There's more movement around individual tasks and, and more meetings required. And we've just seen a slight extended dip in productivity, but that's recovering too. So we're tracking really well. The key thing to point out here is that we've actually delivered eight milestones across the group on time since being based and working from home. So it is business as usual. And in fact, to, to quote David, um, you know, there was life before COVID and there'll be life after COVID. And that's the approach that we're taking. So I'll hand you over to David for slide six and to run through some of the financial highlights. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, uh, very, dis like Carl, I'm disappointed we're not meeting face to face, but uh, we're, we're keen to, to make the best of where we are and, 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 and focus on the positive. So uh, the, the, the financial sections uh, follow a, a broadly familiar format, although there are one or two new pages specific to, to our, our present circumstances. What I'd like to do is focus on three moments in time, if you like. There's, there's the past, there's the present, and then there's the future. Uh, as Carl says, last year seems like a long while ago. Uh, it was a very good year for us. We've delivered a, a strong set of numbers, um, absolutely in line with our expectations, uh, and we're, we're pleased with the, the profit and, and cash performance. Um, this this page, page six, has has the, 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 some of the statistics that you'll you'll be used to seeing before. So I'll pick out a few of these. Adjusted gross margin, excluding royalties, uh, very high. I've consistently guided to around 44% um, as being the, the, the norm. Um, sumo and normal don't seem to necessarily coincide a great deal. Uh, last year, we had um, a number of very good contracts. The, 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 the profitability reflects the mix of projects, but also where we are within those projects and also reflects the utilization which at 95.8 percent um if you remember i've always said that we budget 93 and aim for 95 we have operated in the past at around 97 and broadly every one percent uh, on utilization above 93 uh, loosely translates to one percent extra on the margin adjusted ebitda 14.1 I'll come on and talk about how we've we've calculated that uh, strong cash flow, which we uh, expected and uh, very pleased with. Bottom right hand box contracted near contracted development fees. 73% uh, is the figure as of yesterday. Um, slightly frustrated that uh, we're within sight of that being a higher percentage. Um, but there's some paperwork that uh, is is not coming over from the West Coast of the US as quickly as we'd like it to. We quoted that at 71% on the 25th of March when we announced the deferral of our results. What I'm keen to emphasize is that 73% is on a like-for-like -like basis. So that's relative to our budget for 2020. So it is not based on the lower figure that we think may come in the, the COVID environment, which I'll talk about shortly. 
one of the key things about these set of results is we are changing the way we present our revenue. So when I first joined the group, uh, middle of 2017, uh, it, it, the business model was, was different to how it is now. We either made development fees or royalties working on client IP, or we, we made and sold our own game, as in Snake Pass. Uh, the models evolved, and notably we talk about Spider. Spider is a game uh, that we came up with. It's our concept. Uh, we've, we've been paid to, to make it by Apple. It, it came out on the 20th of March and has been very, very successful. Now, under the old classification of revenue, that development fee sat in with all the other development fees and was not, it wasn't clear how much of those development fees we generated on client IP versus own IP. So what I've been keen to do is split out the IP on which we are generating revenue. So we make development fees and royalties on, on client IP as before. We also make development fees and potentially royalties on own IP in due course and we make game revenues from selling games. So this is the way I anticipate um, disclosing revenue going forward. Just to be clear, you know, our, our track record is around client IP, um, and we have a very strong track record of, of, of delivering that for publishers over many years. The likelihood is that will continue to be the majority of our revenue. We are very keen to do own IP, and over the life of a game, you can probably make more money on, a, on your own IP because you own the game in perpetuity. Now, some, sometimes the games are smaller, so you might make a, a smaller absolute amount of money, but a, but a higher percentage. What we are absolutely clear about is we are not going to set a target or an expectation for what the own IP mix will be in each accounting period. Bear in mind, games take many years to make, um, and we're reporting on six and 12 month periods. So the proportion of revenue in any accounting period that relates to own IP will vary. Um, and if it goes down from 33% in 2019 to a lower figure in future, that's not a problem. We, we're always going to be selecting how we allocate our resource um, to, to, to the best effect for the benefit of the group. Adjusted EBITDA, this, this sort of gets simpler each time I present it. Um, we've got a, a statutory operating profit at the top, which is great. Amortization, there's a little bit of um, residual customer contract and um, customer relationship amortization in there, but that's that's pretty much the end of it. Depreciation includes um, 900,000 on IFRS 16 um, uh, assets, which are now on the balance sheet. Share-based payment is fairly self-explanatory. Investment in co-funded games expensed, uh, most of you will remember that this is where we uh, have a hybrid where rather than us paying for all of a game or a client paying for all of a game, uh, we share the cost um, and we've incurred 1.3 million of cost on that in the year. We've adjusted out the um, uh, impact of IFRS 16 to, to make these figures comparable and then we've got a small amount of transaction fees which gives us the, the adjusted EBITDA of 14.1. We have changed the way we've looked at the prior year comparative because if you remember in the previous years we had a small IFRS 15 adjustment um, which we were keen to, to stop having. I'm keen that we as we as we evolve and mature as a, as a public company that we, we we look at profit after tax and, and earnings per share. Um, sadly it's not as straightforward as we'd like it to be and I've I've spoken I think to most of the people on this on this call um, around the challenge of forecasting tax. Our tax position is unusual, and in, on terms of the statutory accounts, we've actually had a tax credit in each of the last two years. Now, that's a function of the fact that we have um, a significant amount of income is, is VGTR, which is not taxable. We also have significant movements in deferred tax around the share-based payments. And we also have the, the, the tax impact of the special purpose vehicles in which we, we, we publish the games. Now, they make a, a loss for tax purposes, and that, that loss can be offset against the group position um, at the time when the game is launched. And, and that's one of the benefits we've had in 2019. So our profit after tax is actually larger than our profit before tax. The calculation of the statutory earnings per share, you'll all be familiar with. I personally think there are some quirks in that calculation. For example, um, the number of shares excludes the 4.6 million shares that are held in the uh, Employee Benefit Trust, 
which is is, is in accordance with the, 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 the rules of how you define it. So what we've looked at is an alternative performance measure, which I've tried to make relevant to uh, how um, some of the analysts look at our, 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 our numbers. And this is derived from EBITDA um, and, uh, sorry, our adjusted EBITDA. So it reflects the investment in co funded games. Um, uh, I've adjusted out IFRS 16 um, and I apply a full tax charge, so 19% tax on the basis that tax is not controllable. And these figures tie up with the, the LTIP measure that um, is, is applied within the business. Um, and the number of shares you see um, are, are, are in line with, with how the LTIP works. It's probably best if we, we pick this up separately in conversations going forward. What I'm keen to do is try and give some clarity on, on the post-tax earnings of the group going forward. Uh, working capital. So this is, um, just to be clear, this slide is, is probably the only financial slide which goes chronologically left to right. Um, you've seen previous iterations of this. There's not a lot to say about this this year. Um, there is a reduction in networking capital, which is clearly a good thing. What I would emphasize is that at each of these um, accounting rest dates, uh, the working capital position was exactly as we expected it. So we've consistently had very little, um, if any, overdue receivables. And the thing that attracted attention was obviously contract one, which I think everyone knows which game that is, um, which is, is the game on which we agreed to take payment uh, after the, the game was launched. That game has been launched. Um, the 7.8 million has unwound. Um, we now uh, have receivable on that um, 1.3 million, which is a, a recently um, invoiced amount. The, the other items on this, I, I think are probably fairly self-explanatory and I'll, I'll, I'll move on to page 11. The balance sheet uh, remains uh, very simple, uh, goodwill and intangibles. I think everyone knows my views on those. PPE, we seem to have acquired a lot of PPE, which is the right of use asset, which is basically the leases on our studios. Um, deferred tax we've talked about, the working capital items we've picked up on the, on the previous slide. Cash flow, um, most of these figures you'll have seen, um, certainly on the top half, strong cash flow, which is as we expected. Um, we did. We have paid some tax, which you know, we will expect to, to recover the, the quarterly payments. Um, CapEx, I'll talk about uh, shortly. So COVID, um, what can we say about COVID? We've always um, emphasized that our business model is resilient with high visibility. And I think with that, um, it becomes incumbent on us to, to, to actually make an attempt to work out what does COVID mean for us. So we've done a sensitivity analysis. Um, uh, I'm not saying it's right, and it's almost certainly wrong, and the question is how wrong. But what we've looked at is the, the, the headings um, and what this what COVID could mean to us, because clearly there is an impact this year. So we are assuming uh, disruption in the business, uh, significant levels of disruption to the end of June, uh, and we are assuming one turn of lockdown. So we are we are not assuming that we go back to the studios and then go back to working from home. And what we've looked at is what does it mean for the business? Carl's talked about the, the, the slowdown in recruitment. It is harder to recruit in the current context. We're working remotely um, and people are reluctant to, to move jobs. There are actually some interesting dynamics. So many people are losing their jobs and there are people with relevant skills who are becoming available to us. Our, our recruitment team are still working very hard and we are targeting our recruitment. So we're doing less general advertising and more um, individual um, approaches. Uh, we are still recruiting, so we're, we're, we're getting broadly one person a week uh, on board uh, compared to the roughly one person a day we were managing before COVID. So we're anticipating during the, the middle part of the year, um, the increase in headcount will uh, slow down um, and we'll end the year with, with less direct heads than we'd anticipated. Now, we, we've in the past, we've talked about um, guiding the direct headcount for the end of this year to um, around 7.30 to 7.40. Uh, we now think it's probably going to be around 700, um, and that compares to a figure of 634 at the end of December 19. Now, the, the difficulty is not only do you have the year-end delta, but you also have the impact of the, the months before the year-end when people are not on board. 
So we're expecting somewhere in the region of 400, possibly more staff months of capacity that we will not have, that we'd hope to have. Now that means some of the blue sky work that we're yet to identify, um, we will not need to win or indeed be able to win. And the impact on revenue is probably in the region of 4 million and the impact of profit on profit would be two. We also looked at the disruption uh, moving to and from home and the, the, the um, reduction in efficiency. Um, that actually has been pleasingly uh, less of a problem than we'd expected. Uh, it's notable that our um, sickness rate has virtually disappeared while people are working from home. Um, and the efficiency actually has been very good. And Carl talked about the slide earlier on about the recovery time. We've lost a day when we moved everybody from, from one location to another, and we'll lose another day when we move them back. Uh, overall, we think the impact of this could probably be about uh, just over half a million pounds. We're also incurring um, holiday accruals and work from home costs. We're paying the inland revenue approved £26 a month allowance uh, that, that we can pay tax free to all our people. Um, we also typically, um, another function of having the wrong year end is that we accrue holiday at the end of the first half. Um, that's clearly going to be even more pronounced because people are not taking holiday while they're working from home. We are not and do not intend to oblige people to take holiday while they are working from home uh, as we see things at the moment. Um, but we will clearly manage the resourcing when we get back um, into to more normal working patterns. Uh, Atom Hawk, as, as you'll all be aware, has uh, much shorter visibility of, of work than Sumo Digital. Their projects are typically a few weeks or a few months. Uh, we are seeing some slowdown there. The MD of Atom Hawk is a, a, a very cautious um, individual with a, a strong record of delivery, um, and he is anticipating a, a circa 200k impact from, from that slowdown. The good news is there are some offsetting cost savings. We, we typically incur significant travel and entertainment and recruitment costs, which will be uh, obviously saved. Um, there are some offsetting uh, additional costs around IT OPEX from remote working. But overall, we see this as a hopefully short term impact. Uh, it will impact this year. Uh, we will keep the market updated as we get better clarity on it. But our expectation at the moment is that this is the present and the future remains um, very positive. So uh, just sweeping up on a few points that, that we've talked about um, in previous presentations, VGTR remains very much as it is, um, strong support for it. We are a significant user of it. Um, we are very happy with where it is. There is still talk of the rate um, going up uh, if and when Brexit happens. Uh, we're not uh, factoring that into our expectations, but but our view is that the VGTR is 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 um, secure. Margins. Um, we talked about utilisation and project mix impact on the gross uh, adjusted gross margin. Um, the the uh, EBITDA margin was also benefited from the um, uh, the royalties in the year. And we expect to, to return to more normal levels of, of, of uh, margin going forward. So, so we do not think 50% plus gross margin is, is a long-term proposition. Tax charge we've talked about. Working capital, uh, this year feels like a, a quotes more normal year. Uh, in a normal year, we would expect a, a modest amount of working capital outflow. We pay our people every month, obviously, and we're billing them for, uh, billing for their work at the end of the month and collecting them in the following month. So as is typical with a, a, a people-based business, um, a growing business is likely to incur a, a modest level of working capital outflow. CapEx, we, we spent 3.7 million on, on um, PPE last year. 3 million of that was IT. Um, it, linked to headcount and new starters in particular. We also invested in the IT infrastructure, which I have to say now that we're working from home looks like money very well spent. Uh, and we spent a, a relatively modest amount on moving red kite. This year, um, before COVID, we were expecting probably five and a half to six million of CapEx, uh, more spending on IT, but also significant spending on premises. So we've taken on some new units in Sheffield. We're moving both the Newcastle studios to a new location, and we're also moving the Brighton studio. 
Now, I've, I've toned that expectation down for this year because clearly as we're, we're working remotely uh, and can't even access our sites at the moment, um, the, the likelihood of spending money on that is, is, is shifting uh, rightwards. We are expecting for the year as a whole, um, a second half waiting again, uh, not dissimilar to last year. Um, that's a function of um, the, the where we are with the projects. Um, there are quite a few projects in pre-production in the first half of the year where the resourcing is, is, is less than when the, the projects go into the full production. It's all as, as expected and in line with our plans. Um, but that, the, the project phasing combined with the headcount growth, even with, with the COVID recruitment challenge, uh, means we are expecting a second half waiting once again. So this is the last page for the, the financial section. Uh, again, you've seen this format before. This is looking at the, 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 the client and project concentration. Um, we've got a new entrant into the, the process for FY19, who I've imaginatively called Client F. Um, so the top three clients for whom we're doing seven main projects plus some additional work represent 64% of the revenue in the year. Um, we're not concerned about that. And if you look at the dynamic of, of 17, 18 and 19, there's significant movement in who are our main clients. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it naturally evolves and it also reflects the, the scale of our business and the nature of the projects on, on which we're working. I think on that basis, I will then pass back to Carl to, to carry on talking about the business. So what's very pleasing um, on this slide, as opposed to the last time we spoke, is the fact that we now have 21 projects with 12 different clients seven games or, or publisher partnerships announced over the period. So in terms of games, you can see at the top of, of the left-hand box, Spider, which was actually launched on the first day of, of lockdown. Um, and we were very happy with that launch. It's also tracking very well in terms of uh, user review scores. And, uh, and we are constantly providing updates and, and basically games as a service element to support the product. Uh, other announcements were Two Point Hospital, which were developed by um, Red Kite Games for Sega. We've got Pasta Punch, which we announced last year. And, and very recently, the announcement of Hot Shot Racing with Curve, which is out later this year. And then just to reiterate, the two client relationships that have been announced were Focus Home Interactive and 2K. So what we have here is a growing number of projects. Uh, and although we have a little more to talk about than we did at the last presentation, we continue to be limited in what we can share due to client confidentiality. However, what is very pleasing to see is that we've got a great mix of games and projects. All the studios are very busy. Uh, and business development uh, has been extremely active. And as David alluded to earlier, we are expecting new contracts imminently too. You'll see at the top right hand side of that slide, we, we do show the, the new Warrington studio. It does now have more than one staff member. Um, obviously, it's going to be a challenge to build that studio as quickly as we would have liked this year, uh, but it is already contributing to other projects within the group. So our competitive advantage, we, we always talk about our people uh, and, and what we do in terms of our game development and creative services. Our people have adapted extremely well to working from home. We're providing a lot of support to ensure both physical and mental health is maintained. We are performing lots of different activities, you know, team meetings, virtual pubs. Uh, but the most important thing is nobody's gone off the radar. All of our teams remain 100% engaged with their other team members and with the projects that they're working on. Having our own tech continues to be a, a, a valuable um, a underlying uh, a efficiency gain for us. We're working on multiple large projects where we utilize our own technology uh, and our own engine. And that continues to provide um, a great benefit. Our management systems, which we've always alluded to uh, and, and started to talk about more uh, over the last 12 to 15 months, 
but we, they've only required slight adoption and minor modifications to allow us to continue to work from home and, and base decisions on with good quality data. As you saw earlier on the productivity slide, that's just a snapshot of a part of the information system that we get. And then finally, our scale. Now we talk about our scale being a competitive advantage because of the size of projects and the number of projects that, that we can take on at any one time. But also it would appear that larger developers seem to be fearing slightly better during this period of uncertainty than the smaller developers. Our business model remains the same. We have a lower risk contracting model. Our long-term contracts really do provide stability uh, within uh, the environment that we're in, especially now. We've had significant milestone receipts in the last couple of weeks, as we were expecting. So it's business as usual, as far as we're experiencing. And we will continue to have the majority of our business on a milestone basis. We remain deeply embedded with our partners and, and the relationships are extremely strong. As, as I mentioned on the first slide I spoke to, our partners have been extremely supportive with us moving to a working from home environment. And, and that, that just demonstrates the level of trust that, that we have between us. So headcount, uh, recruitment, retention and utilization. So first of all, the year end headcount position was, was very strong and actually ahead of our internal target, which has given us a great platform to start 2020. We also had extremely strong utilization in 19 with in excess of 95 percent utilization across the group. India, in fact, was much higher than we usually target. And we do expect that to come down to a normal rate in India during 20. Uh, and in fact, as we've said in the past, if we're going to have underutilization, we will probably move it into the Indian office. Uh, and we normally target around 80% utilization there. We continue to use contractors. And we had a slightly increased year on year against 18. In 19, we had 5.7% of revenue represented from contractor uh, input rather than 49 uh, in, in the previous year and we'll continue to use contractors as much as possible. Again, as I said earlier, there is the, the added potential of having a more flexible workforce going forward if our clients continue to be flexible in allowing us to move confidential work to a working from home environment. But as we said, recruitment is going to be the biggest challenge this year, and we don't expect to see the same rates of recruitment that we experienced in 2019. Obviously, it's not the top of people's minds at the moment to move jobs. Uh, but equally, we also anticipate a, a slowdown in attrition because we, you know, we, we provided a very strong environment for people to work within within this current unsettled period. And in addition to that, we are in the same boat as everybody else. So I, I, we don't expect our team to be looking for for the jobs too. The latest market information, um, and, and I guess this is a bit of a moving target at the moment, but the latest information suggests that it's extremely strong right now with more people gaming than ever. Steam seems to, to keep breaking its own concurrent player records and both Sony and Microsoft also seem to be benefiting from more people playing games. It's also very interesting to, to see the World Health Organization's recommending people to play games online as a way of keeping socially connected and maintaining mental health. Um, it's great to see that there's some positive recognition from games and hopefully we'll gain a lot of new, new people uh, into the gaming market uh, off the back of this. Increased digital distribution has been a component that we've discussed over the last couple of years and it will obviously be accelerating right now. Uh, people can't get to the shop so they're downloading all the new games and that obviously has a positive impact you know they can still access and experience new games more platforms both sony and microsoft have confirmed that they're not expecting any delays in the launch of their new hardware later this year um, there does seem to be a lot of speculation around that but but they seem adamant that the consoles will be released on time and 
as Sumo, we remain well placed to benefit from the increasing demand for high quality creative game development and services. Uh, our business development pipeline is as full as ever, um, and we are remaining engaged with and both our existing partners and new clients to look at a way of, of being able to uh, accelerate the position that we're currently in. Environmental, social and governance, so ESG. Uh, it's certainly becoming a, a more important aspect of, of Sumo's commitment, not only to our people, but our investors and our clients and players too. And it's something that, that we are internally having more discussions around. Our priority is to have a, an agreed aligned interest with our various stakeholders with regard to ESG. And, and presently, although we consider a lot of these aspects independently, we are now committing to pulling all this together holistically and are looking to implement a recognized framework probably a framework called B Corp, uh, and we are underway with evaluating that right now. Our strategy and the next 12 months. So our strategy is broadly the same. You know, we want to, to be involved in making more great games, you know, being responsible for generating more original own IP, working with more prominent clients at IP. Acquisitions still remains active. Um, we, we are very keen to continue making further acquisitions, hopefully more meaningful acquisitions. It's obviously challenging at the moment with, with the current situation and not being able to travel, but we are still very active. Um, and the continued organic growth, we will look to, to open new studios in new locations and build on the success that we've had to date with doing that. In terms of the outlook in the next 12 months, we're aiming to do a Capital Markets Day in June or July, subject to changes in the current situation, obviously. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to seeing everybody face to face, fingers crossed, for our H1 results in September. We as a board believe that our outlook remains extremely positive. And although we're facing on some uncharted waters at the minute, we believe we built a great boat. We've got a really able crew and we believe the future is really strong for Sumo and the market's positive. And to reiterate what I said earlier, there was life before COVID, there'll be life after it and we might even come out of this stronger. And that's it from my presentation. And we'll move on to questions. Ken Rump from Jeffries International has asked a few questions. One is how many games are included in the 16 million own IP work? What's the largest as a percentage? Um, we, did, we don't disclose that. I mean, we've, we've talked about the fact we've got five co-funded games. Um, we, as, as you'll appreciate, Ken, the, the commercial sensitivity of what we, we have, um, we, we're, we're not disclosing how many games or which games are in there other than the fact that, that, that patently the, the Apple, the two Apple games are both in that figure. And the next question is again from Ken Rump. What's the total self-funded IP at the year end? Um, the, there is uh, half a million pounds uh, included in um, uh, fixed assets in relation to self-funded own IP. Uh, most of that is past the punch, um, but but the, the so so yeah, it's, it's half a million pounds in 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 intangible assets. And um, he also goes on to say, "Congrats on the COVID sensitivity analysis." <laughs> Can you give us an example of when you've had to decide between own IP and client IP projects? and how you made your decision. And second question, should we see a strong surge in recruitment when lockdown is lifted? And can you re-begin interviewing? And third, can you give us an update of the new console launches and how you see them impacting Sumo work plans? Sorry, this is from Bob Lau. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll happily um, answer those questions, but then I'll, I'll ask I'll ask Carl to 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 to, to add further, yeah. further to it. So, the, the question of deciding between projects, um, 
we have to be clear the way our business works. We, we are constantly looking at the, the future pipeline of opportunities. So this isn't something where the phone rings and you have to make an instant decision between this or that. So, so we're, we're constantly looking at the workload we've got, how those games are going to evolve, how other opportunities are coming in. So we've thought in the past about the fact we're, we're, we're generally operating at full capacity. So, so projects that we are looking to take on, we have quite a long lead time before they, 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 they actually come on board. So the, the, the decision about which projects we take on is a commercial one. Um, and the leadership team are constantly looking at you know, how can we, how do we want to be operating in six, 12 months time? Which games do we want to be taking on? Um, what are the commercial benefits of that game? What What's the quality of the game? How will it be received by our people? So there's a whole bunch of factors. Um, this isn't a sort of a short term, quick decision. It's a long term evolved de de decision that we, we, we make. What was the second question? Will we see a strong surge in recruitment once lockdown is lifted? Well, I guess the answer to that is we, we very much hope so. Now, the, 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 the drawback to where we are is none of us have ever been in a pandemic before and none of us have ever come out of a pandemic. So how people react is is completely unknown. We would like to think that, that there will be a strong surge in recruitment, but, but how people react to having been locked down for however long they're locked down we, we just don't know uh, we're certainly going to be ready to recruit and we're going to be doing everything we can we are still recruiting now so so the, the question about interviewing you know we are still interviewing people remotely um, there was a slight paradox that the hiring managers are more accessible by video link than they were when they were working in their studios and one of the bottlenecks in recruitment was was always getting candidates in front of hiring managers um, so Short answers: We don't know. Uh, we would like to, to think there'll be a surge in recruitment, and we'd like to do everything we can to to, to make that happen. The um, um, the other question we need to factor into this is: Can we look at recruiting more flexibly? So, can we recruit remote workers in areas where we don't presently have studios, uh, which has been something we've not done in the past? So that there are various opportunities in in, in that. Carl, do you want to add? Um, to, to, to yeah, what I'll, said? I'll just pick up on the the final point, which was around console launches and providing more opportunities. I mean, inevitably, the the more platforms there are out there, the more opportunities there'll be. So we we see it as a, as as a very positive step forward with any launch of any new hardware. So the next question is from Patrick O'Donnell from Goodbody. Can you talk a little bit about the potential size of acquisitions that you'd look at? And would you look at acquiring a games developer for your own IP purposes? Everything uh, is on the table. We're, we're looking at, at smaller bolt-on acquisitions, uh, similar to, to the Red Kite and the Chinese Room um, acquisitions that we made. And we're also looking at the viability of doing larger acquisitions too. The, the key thing is we're looking at a, a complementary mix of activities within the acquisition targets we look at. And that is in terms of either the skill set, in terms of genres that they provide, or the clients that they're currently working with. And if they happen to have a mix of owned IP within that, that, that looks compelling, then that obviously adds to the strength of, of that potential target too. And Andrew Bryant from Liberum asks, with in-game development revenues, you now identify 31 million from clients and 16 million from your own IP. Is there much difference in gross margin, short term or over the life? Interesting question. And um, it, it, again, it varies. So, so generally, um, the margins are not particularly different um, in, in the short term. That the benefit, as I as I mentioned about own IP, is that that um, you've got a longer term monetization opportunity. So, so for example, residual sales of a game in in the later years is incremental revenue that you don't get if it's not your own IP. So, I think if you if you analyze the margin you make on a game over its life, the the margin will be higher on own IP. Now, the, the quantum of profit may not be higher because if it's a smaller game, you may make a bigger percentage, but a smaller absolute amount. 
Um, but it comes back to the, the, the resource allocation question and the decisions we have to make. You know, do we work on client IP and secure a margin short term? Um, uh, and, and why would we, you know, we've, we've got to be very careful about deciding to work on our own IP if there's a margin compromise and be absolutely convinced that there is some benefit to doing that in the longer term. And Benjamin May from Berenberg asks, given the very strict lockdown in India, how are your operations being affected in that market? And is WFH as easy in that working from home as easy in that market as in the UK? Fortunately, we have a highly skilled workforce in India and we actually migrated them to work from home well in advance of the India government's mandate to, to moving everybody to work from home. We're experiencing the same level of productivity across the group, but in India and, and in, in the UK and Canada, for that matter. Um, so we're not seeing any challenges. We, we have probably had to provide a little bit more support in hardware and connectivity within the, the uh, India office. Uh, but that's been the, the only significant difference um, within the migration to working from home. And Benjamin May goes on to ask, is there scope to increase prices in this environment, given publisher demand as a result of COVID? And just wondering if you can offset some reduced work hours. I think taking advantage of the current situation with how short term it is might be a, a, a short term um, decision in terms of having the trust of our clients. Yes, there is a lot of demand, uh, but they're also well aware of the the costs on bringing our games to market um, and, and using a pandemic to as an excuse to put up prices might not be seen in the spirit of most of the relationships that we have. However, if there's an additional cost, because we have to continue to work from home, and that is the price of being able to continue to work, then obviously we'd have those discussions with our clients around the additional need if we need to. And Richard Williamson from Edison asks, are you now comfortable you're back on track to achieve milestones on all ongoing projects? Yeah, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, Richard, we, um, we have delivered successfully eight milestones on time since moving to work from home. And we are tracking productivity um, very closely to ensure that we assign the right number of resources to ensure future delivery of milestones too. The, the short term pain and disruption of the drop in productivity on a, in a couple of cases hasn't resulted in, in missed milestones because we don't actually cover every single deliverable for every single staff member on every milestone. So that's been managed and, and we'll continue to manage that. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're not seeing any potential disruption on, on milestone delivery. And Ross Broadfoot from Investec asks, how were you finding recruitment at the back end of last year and in the early part of this year? So the back end of last year was extremely strong and, and we actually you know, exceeded our internal headcount target, um, which we were very pleased with. Um, the, the start of this year seemed to be getting off to, to a similar strong start. Obviously, it was halted pretty quickly because I think people actually started to take more notice of COVID mid-February, um, well before the lockdown, and there was some anticipation of changes to working practices. Um, but we anticipate that you know we will continue to be a very attractive option for new talent. We're working on some great projects. We've got great clients. We've got a... a, a an extremely good culture at Sumo. So we expect the recruitment to, to pick up when we go back to work. However, as David has also said, we just don't know what we don't know. And, and what you know, we, we don't know how people will feel at the end of this current period. And Andrew Bryant from Liberum asks, given the planned expansions in your UK operations, what do you think is your approximate headcount capacity going to be? That's a good question. Interesting question. <laughs> yeah. So, so we are in, still in the process of moving three locations. In fact, we actually, we actually moved uh, the Canadian office of Atomhawk on, on the day of lockdown. Um, 
and so they're ready to move into new premises as soon as they they go back into the office we we've got other new premise moves get going ahead in brighton in newcastle um we will probably look to expand further in um in leamington too and we're also looking at what we can do in other locations but we're also hope, hopeful that our clients will allow us to do more flexible working with, whilst maintaining the level of confidentiality they expect and that could provide a, a, a better opportunity for us in terms of accelerating headcount growth without the need for investing in, in future premises and patrick o'donnell from good body asks is the target pipeline concentrated on existing geographies or would you consider an expansion into other territories we are considering expansions into other territories as well as existing and now we're going to move over to kevin ashton or i'm muting your mic kevin if you'd like to ask your question uh, good morning yeah, I was just asking sort of more industry stuff, really. I mean, obviously, there's a lot going on. We've talked about it in the past, streaming platforms, new entrants, all this kind of stuff. But the one that's um, sort of cropped up uh, is, is Amazon coming in with a couple of new games lined up. And I guess my question was really, um, and again, this is not about um, uh, your relationship with, with them or anybody, but just from an industry point of view, I mean, they tend to kind of do things themselves. I mean, these two big games that they're set to launch as their first games, um, are you aware that they're, they're using work for hire or, or, or in the studios? Is that not something that kind of gets around the industry, Carl? We, we're aware that they've, they've used a little bit of co-dev support. Um, in fact, Amazon acquired a studio I knew very well uh, based in Irvine called Double Helix back in 2014. Yeah. And they've obviously been working on, on some, some projects since. So when you look at the timeline, I think that's the most interesting thing. They acquired the studio in 2014. They're talking about a launch at some point in 20 or 21 uh, yeah. for game releases. So a, a five to six year development cycle to get a game ready for launch. Wow. But, you know, that's that's as much as, as really as I know. Um, Amazon have been quite um, cautious with the information that they've drip feed into the market. But at the same time, they are obviously very keen to get involved in the video game space. It's, it is a long-term investment. Uh, it seems that they, they originally started thinking about this as early as 2012, 2013. Wow. Um, but you can only believe that having had the time, they'll be well-placed when they do come to the market properly. Yeah, that makes sense. And have you heard anything about when Project Tempo launches from them? or? No, to be to be honest, just just what I've read in 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 the press. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. Sure. No problem. Thanks, Kevin. So the next question is from James Lockyer from Peel Hunt, and he asks: Given that games are often planned to be forty hours of gameplay, for example, which in normal times would take a couple of weeks or a couple of months, depending on the average player. With usage up, are you seeing evidence that players are finishing games sooner and hence demanding new content or chapters, etc.? And has that been figured into future release schedules? Um, as, uh, it's an interesting view, James. People have more time, so they're getting through things quicker. I think at the end of the day, the experience that, that people uh, acquire when they buy a game is, is a level of expectation based on the price. And for a AAA, you'd expect... 40 hours plus of gameplay but most triple a games and in fact most double a games now also come with an element of games as a service so that there is the opportunity to continue to invest in that game and 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 experience new playing modes or new environments to to extend the playing time i think it's too early to say whether the current environment will change the demands and the way we see games need to be delivered. You know, we've only been at home on lockdown probably for you know, four to five weeks max uh, in the UK, probably slightly longer in, in other territories. But that data point's probably too early to, to speculate on in terms of the impact on the number of hours that need to go into a game for launch going forward. And the next question is from Katie Cousins from Shore Capital. How have you been addressing customer engagement 
post-launch during the lockdown and have you seen any significant changes that could continue, for example, more live stream events and other things like that? So our customer engagement's been pretty much the same. Most of our clients are based on the West Coast, so we tend to engage with our clients through video conferencing and, and teleconferencing anyway. So that's not changed. Um, the, in terms of industry events, we, we set up our own virtual GDC to allow us to continue to, to maintain the relationships, account management and new business development. And as new ev- events evolve, I'm sure there'll be an element of, of streaming and, and remote attendance that will become available as, as a standard uh, to, to all events. I'd certainly welcome not having to travel so much to go to all the events if I could get everything done I needed to do via a video conference link. Um, but it's still not always the same as, as going out there and, and having you know, a social coffee or beer with, with uh, a lot of our partners. So I don't see it supplement it or I don't see it replacing um, the need to have industry events, but it may well supplement the current industry events that are planned. Casper Erskine from N Plus One Singer asks, is there an opportunity to flex up outsource spending with third parties in the short term? Smaller development outfits are likely to be seeing a cash flow squeeze. There seems to be an opportunity for Sumo to support these smaller players, drive up near-term Sumo capacity and enables some additional visibility regarding potential bolt-ons in the medium term. I think you're absolutely right, Casper, in the fact that some of the smaller developers are struggling and, and there may be ways that we can help our clients with that. The biggest challenge we've got is our own utilisation and the fact that our own headcount won't be growing at the rate that we wanted it to grow either. Uh, and we're already very busy. Um, but I do think it, it will potentially lead to to new acquisition opportunities going forward too, as as some perhaps some smaller developers see the opportunity to be part of, of a larger, more stable organization. So when challenges like this do happen and do occur that that you know they don't have the same threat or uncertainty that they're probably experiencing right now. And Ross Broadfoot from Investec asks, would you mind giving us an update on Atom Hawk and its longer term growth prospects? Atom Hawk was always bought in to be a, a very um, important strategic partner to Sumo Digital because of the type of activity that it does. And we, we really value the fact that we have the ability to do things at the, at the sharp end. And in, that is in terms of the original concept of ideas and visualizing the original ideas. And Atom Hawk partners very well with Sumo Digital on that, as well as working with its own roster of partners. But concept art is is probably, you know, it's not fast growing in terms of the ability that it offers, but what it is doing is providing a very key service to the start of life of new games. So Atom Hawk's very important strategically from that perspective. We're always investigating whether there's opportunities to to leverage the skills that we have there by offering other service lines on a similar basis. And and if that opportunity arises, we'll be sure to to let you all know. But we we are constantly evaluating whether there's other opportunities within the Atom Hawk uh, brand. Great. And that is the end of the question. So, Carl and David, many thanks indeed. That's the end of the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.